Salvation is never ending to those who believe in Jesus. Amen? Amen. And I'm glad I got a little one in here that's going to preach with me. Amen? Amen? I hear him. Amen. Praise the Lord. I like that. Now that reminds me when we was in Maryland, we had a little, I think a, a little grand, great-granddaughter uh, when we would be singing and praising God. And next thing you know, she started shouting, just screaming. And we're like, hey, she's praising. Let her go. Let her go. But let's talk about this. Salvation is what Jesus was sent here to do. Jesus came to save souls. He came to save the world for anybody, whosoever, would believe in him, they would have eternal life if they believe in his name. So every person born in this world or will be born needs, and this is the emphasis, needs to be saved. Amen? Now I want to put an emphasis on that word need because where we're going today, which is why the subject is salvation, is never ending is because we're going to talk a little bit more about not just the gift of salvation but what it means to be saved amen sometimes we get to the place where we're saved and we've been born again and we're content right there and 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 like we're going to heaven we're good but i want you to know something that salvation is more than that one time of being born again. My brother can testify today. God did what? Saved him from a car that was totaled. Amen? That's salvation. That's deliverance. Amen? And so where I want you to get and where I want you to know, go with me in this message, is understanding that we need, and I want to put the emphasis on the word need, God. We need Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. Because after you're born again, we're going to experience some things in life for the rest of our lives that if we try to do and be without God, we're going to fail. We're going to be frustrated. We're going to have issues, trials that we seem like just won't go away persecutions that arise and people will talk about you and it just seems like everything that can go wrong will be going wrong but see when you have God when you have the Holy Spirit in you that is there to protect you that is there to guide you to give you some understanding of what's going on you still got peace even when the crazy stuff going on y'all hear me so Jesus fulfilled the requirement with his own blood. So my question to you is this. Do you need to be saved? Do you need to be saved? You ain't got to say anything, gentlemen. Just throwing it out there. I want you to think about it. But the question is, do you need to be saved? Because the, the answer that most people will say is, if they're born again, I am saved. Amen? And if you are saved, my question still applies to you. Do you need to be saved? Because just because you're born again doesn't stop all the crazy stuff that's going to come your way. And when it happens, you need to be saved again and again and again. How many know that God sends his angels to encamp around his children? That God sends his angels to minister, which is to serve us. Amen? The Bible says be, be careful how you talk to people. Be careful how you treat people, for you entertain angels unaware. There's people that are disguised as angels, or angels, excuse me, disguised as people that we don't even realize are angels until maybe in hindsight, and then you can look back and go, wait a minute. That, I didn't know that person, but that person blessed me tremendously with what I needed that nobody else could have known except God. And because this person did what they did, was that an angel? And I'm here to say that we need to be careful because when we're living in this life, do you need to be saved? It's never ending. Salvation, deliverance, 
rescue. That's what salvation means, by the way. And I'm going to get somewhere. I'm going to be going somewhere. Because God did something through Jesus that was so awesome that the Lord has shown me that we're going to look at in just a moment. Being born again meant you were saved from something or will be saved from something if you're not saved yet. But it means that you've been saved something. Well, what were we saved from? What was it that Jesus did on the cross that when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, he already put it out there that when you come to him and say, Lord, forgive me, he said, I've already done it. In the flesh, on the cross, publicly, I declare that to whosoever will need forgiveness is here. And I've already made it available. And so when he did that, he got us to a place where we became his children, right? He did something else. He saved us from eternal damnation. We were and will be, if you're not born again, end up on the wrong side of God's will. See, what some people don't understand is that you're going to exist forever, one way or the other. You're not just when you die, that's the end of your life. Your soul still lives. And if you're on the wrong side, you'll be forever, listen to this, you'll be forever tormented in the fiery uh, flames of hell. If you're on the right side, you're going to live. You're still going to exist, but one is death and the other one is life. Death is eternal damnation, but it's eternal. Life is eternal, everlasting life, which means you live. No suffering, no tears, no more pain. There's no issues. You're in the presence of a, a loving God, merciful God, wonderful God, a God who did what only he could have done to bring you to his bosom. And he says, all you ever have to do is just understand what it cost me and surrender to me your heart. And so Jesus saved us from something. Well, my question is when I ask, do you need to be saved? Is there anybody that needs to be delivered from anything else? Like, is there any sickness going on in your life? Is there a troubled mind that people might be, rest be wrestling with? Is there, is there a poverty situation that you need more cash or more finances? I mean, you can go down the list of things that this world will bring to you that you can say, I need help. I need God. I can't do it myself, but I know you can because you own everything. The earth is the Lord's, the world and they that dwell therein. It all belongs to God. And so anything that we need, that there's that, that, that word again, need, is coming to a place of needing to know who to turn to. But here's where we're going to get into the word. Amen. I thought this was awesome. This life that we're living is never ending, right? Salvation, I'm saying. Jesus, in preparing his disciples, in chapter 14, let's look at verse, uh, let's pick up in verse um, 10. And it reads like this. Do you not believe, this is Jesus, the words of Jesus talking to his disciples. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? He says, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. What Jesus is doing and trying to set them up for, because we're going to read more about where we're going, but what he's doing at this moment, he's trying to convince them to understand my relationship with my dad. Understand that my father and I are so connected that when I speak, it's the father speaking through me. Where there is no separation between me and my father. Amen? And he wants them to get it because what he's saying is that because we're such connected in such a way, I walk in obedience to my father. I walk into submission to my father. He says here, he says, uh, I do not speak on my own authority. I do what my father says to do. He says, so I want to take you somewhere because as we continue to read, you're going to find out why that's important. Because the disciples are trying to figure out, wait a minute, show us the Father. 
This is what they were saying earlier when they were, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man can enter the heaven except through me. And he says, well, show us the way. And he says, I am the way. What, do you, what don't you get, he's saying. He says, well, look, let me bring it to you another way. He says, show us the Father and we will believe. He says, I and my Father are one. We are the same maker. We have the same nature. We have the same spirit. And if you're born again, guess what? You have the same makeup, the same spirit that is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's why he talks about oneness. Because I pray that they may be one in us as I am in you and you in me. That they may be one in us. He's talking about the spirit that is in us. But, but listen, he's trying to get them to see that and prepare them for this type of relationship that they and us are all going to need to go on after salvation. And I'm going to show you this in a minute, but I want you to hear this. We need to know how to have a relationship with our Father God, amen, through Jesus, amen, by the power of the Holy Spirit, which makes it all happen, so that we can look at the next couple verses. Because Jesus did something when he's about to leave that blesses them in such a way and will bless us if we grab hold of this thing in such a way that it's going to affect how we live with power and victory. Anybody need victory in, in this world we're living in? Amen. Amen. Anybody need power when the adversary kicks and screams and raises his ugly head and you want to be able to have some kind of power to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord and proclaim what God says and the devil would then have to flee because he's no match for God? We're all in the same place, right? We want to be victorious and walk with power that God gives us, right? What did he leave us with then? He was setting the stage. Well, he left us as we look down in verse 11. He says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. He says, listen, if you don't believe my words, Jesus says, at least believe me because of what I can do. The miracles that I've shown you, can't nobody do that. Can't nobody else raise the dead. Can't nobody have a person that's leprous. All of a sudden, I just speak to them without touching them. And as they're walking, the leprous disappears. The leprosy disappears. Can't nobody do that. Can't nobody other than the Spirit of God cast out demons? Except the Spirit of God. Amen? He said, I want you to see what he's saying. Is, listen, let me, say, let me read that again. Believe me, Jesus says, that I am in the Father and the Father in me. But then he says, or else, again, believe me for the sake of the works. But the point is, Jesus wants us to believe him. He wants us to get to a place that when you see the word of God and God is saying, this is what my word will do. This is what my word says. If you believe me, you will have what you're asking. Right? Now, what did he leave us? What did he leave us with? That is so awesome that I keep saying it, but I haven't proclaimed it yet. Can I tell you? Can I get y'all ready for it now? Mm -hmm. Amen. Can I get say, let me hear you say amen loudly? Amen. All right, here's what he left. Verse 12. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I look that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my father. Does that sound like he's talking about being born again? No. That's talking about doing stuff. That's talking about uh, God using us to be a witness, to bless people with power. Amen? This is talking about after you're saved, God says, I'm going to need you to be able to do the things that I was doing. Matter of fact, I want you to be able to do greater things than I did, but you're going to need something. You can't do it without this thing that I'm about to share with you. And he says it right here in the next verse. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. 
that the Father may be glorified in the, in the Son. Now he says, now, just in case you, you thought I didn't say it right, let me read another verse, which is the next verse. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So what is it that he's trying to tell us that is so powerful, that is so awesome, that he says, if you ask it, you will, I will do it. Let me tell you what it is. The name of Jesus. If you want to know what power that name has, let me tell you what that name means. His name, Jesus, means Savior. His name, Jesus, means Deliverer. His name, Jesus, means Rescuer. Joshua. He says, every time you call my name, Every time you use my name to do whatever, I'm now giving you authority and power to produce. If you want to know how powerful that is, God says, whatever you ask in my name, not only will I do it, he says, that I will do twice. Well, let's go move over to chapter 16. One page over if, if you have your paper Bibles. And look at verse 23. No, let's pick up in verse 22. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. He says, I know you're sorrowful because I'm leaving. And they've been walking with Jesus for, for three years. And all of a sudden, he's like, I got to go. But he says, hey, but if I don't go, I can't send the helper. I can't send the Holy Spirit. I can't send the power of God to you that will not only be with you, he said it'll be in you. So now we have the power of God in us. I'm going somewhere. Verse 23. And that day you will ask me nothing, Jesus says. Most assuredly I say to you, Whatever you ask the Father in what? My name, he will give you. But I like this next verse. He says, until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be, uh, that your joy may be full. Amen? Amen? Let's go down to verse 26. If you want to see how the name of Jesus, he says in verse 26, in that day you will ask in my name, right? And I, and, and, but here's the part I love. I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. Jesus says, no, 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 no. I've given you the Holy Spirit, the power of God. I've given you the authority now to speak my name. And every time you speak my name, it means I'm going to deliver. I'm going to uh, uh, save. I'm going to rescue. Whatever it is. Do you know, I was in, my brother, it's funny that you're hearing me talking about this now. I was in a car accident, it wasn't total, but this was years ago. And I was driving and I ran a stop sign. It was my fault, I was on the phone. Don't y'all ever do that. Nobody ever do that, because this was before they made the law of not having the, oh, you know, you're not allowed to use your hand now. And so I'm on the phone, but I'm talking to a chaplain of a prison that I administer in the prison with. And so he's on the other phone. Uh, on the other line. And him and I just talking, talking, and I ran the stop sign, and all I heard was a horn and a skirt. And then all I said was, Oh, Jesus! That's all I said. Phone went dead, tore up the car, not told it, but tore it up. You know the witness that the chaplain said to me the next time I talked to him? He says, You know what? I know what's in you. Because years before that, before I was saved, I probably wouldn't have used those words. But by calling Jesus' name, he rescued me. He saved me. See, what's in you is going to come out. And if you are saved and you are walking in God's will, regardless of you making mistakes, regardless of you, 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 you uh, uh, making errors or, or feeling, un, un, um, what do you call it, when you're uh, not adequate enough, you know what I mean, to do things, that's irrelevant. You're a child of God. And as a child of God, God is responsible, just like your parents, when you were being raised, were responsible 
for you. God is responsible for his children. He will always look out for his children. All he said is, use my name when you need me. Don't use my name in vain. You know how some people, oh my God, OMG. But it's used for the wrong things. Thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. And he says, because my name is powerful. My name it means much more than what a lot of people think. But today, you understand that that name is what God gave us, or Jesus gave us before he left, so that when he leaves, he says, now, you got the power of the Holy Spirit, and now, you got the authority to use my name. So every time you use my name, use it for the right reasons, that the Father may be glorified. Okay, we're going to end up in our three points, and we're done. It's in your programs. You'll see a little insert. And it says at the top, salvation is never ending for those who believe in Jesus. Number one, it's, well, first it says, having the right humility places our dependence before God. Having the right humility. Amen? And that's what we're going to look at. Number one is, we need to let God know we need his help. Amen? We don't need to reinvent the wheel. If God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. If God says, if I be for you, who can be against you? If God tells you, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If God tells us, I work all things together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called. If God tells us, I got your back, don't ever leave him out because we need him. This is where we're going. And look at Exodus chapter 3, and if you don't, uh, I'll just read it for you. This is the story of Moses. Uh, after the people had rebelled, they had built a golden calf, and God was angry with them. And God was starting to tell Moses several times, but I'm going to read this one, one, one place. But he was telling Moses several times, listen, I'm going to send my angel before you, and they will be with you, but I will not go with you. I, basically, he was like, I had enough of these rebellious people. This is before Jesus came to save souls. But they had rebelled, and then they got back right. Then they rebelled, and then they got back right. And at some point, God says, I'm done. But look at what Moses says. And this is when, in chapter uh, 33, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. Chapter 33, uh, in verse 12, it picks up. And it says, the promise of God's presence. Then Moses said, in verse 12, Then Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Moses is like, who's going to go with me? And he says, yet you have said, I know you by name. And you also have, found, or have also found grace in my sight. So Moses is saying to God, listen, you tell me that you know me by name. You tell me I got favor and I got grace. But you haven't said, when I lead this people, who's going with us? And so verse 13 says, now therefore, Moses, pray, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, Show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. But here's the verse, verse 14. And he said, my presence will go with you. God says this. Um, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Look at what Moses says. Then he said to him, to God, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. Moses is telling God, look, thank you if you're really going to go be with us. But I tell you what, God, if you're not going, we don't want to go either. Because we can't go and do and be without you. We need you, God. And the first point is we need to let God know we need his help. John 6, 65, back over in John, chapter 6. Look at what this says. This is the Jesus talking to his disciples and you know, he had just got finished talking about, unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you will have no part in me. And, and the disciples didn't understand. And some of them just said, you know what, this is too hard. And they left. They left the presence of God. They left Jesus. And so we pick up in verse uh, John chapter, what did I say, 6, 65. And we pick up in uh, 65 and it says, and Jesus said, he said, Therefore I say to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted 
to him by my Father. A person can't even get saved unless God the Father brings them, draws them, answers some. The word granted is a result of a request. When you say, I grant you something, somebody had to ask, can I have? Well, your mom, your grandma, your great-grandma, your ancestors, if they're like some of us here, we pray for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, our, our, our children that's not yet been born, that's going to be great-great-great-great. We pray for them now. You know why? Because no one can come to God unless it has been granted by the Father. So is that in God's will that people are saved? Of course it is. So we're praying God's will when we're praying for others to be born again, which we do. But anyway, let's keep, that was a little side thing. But he says, but there are, uh, uh, let's see, verse uh, 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with them no more. I want you to know something. Those disciples that walked with Jesus no more, that left Jesus, were not believers of Jesus. Y'all follow me? They were disciples. Disciples don't automatically make you a, a believer. A disciple, the definition of the word disciple means a learner of scripture. I can sit in a Bible uh, a college and, and, and theology college and, and be taught everything they want me to know, get the head knowledge, pass through the grades, get my, my degree, and still not be saved. But I learned. Amen? So he says, Jesus says, in verse 67, then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? And look at what Simon Peter said. But Simon Peter answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Verse 69, also, we have come to believe. Here's the believer. We have come to believe that you are the, I mean, that uh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Simon Peter and the twelve said, look, what do you mean? What do you mean, do we want to go? No. We need you, Lord. You have the words of eternal life. You are the one. You are the Christ. We know who you are. Why would we want to leave that alone? Why do we want, why do we not, like Moses, want you not to be with me in my life? I need you. This is what we're saying to God. I need you in my life. Everywhere I go, go with me. You said you'll never leave me? Thank you for that. Because that means wherever I am, you're right there with me. I need you. Number two, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. Same book, John, but let's look over in chapter uh, 16 and verses 7 through, 7 through 15. And it says it this way. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. These are the words of Jesus. It is to your advantage that I go. Or that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, that's who the Helper is. He's known as the Comforter. Oh, amen. He says, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe me. They will believe in me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world, the adversary, is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Reading 14, he will glorify me, for he will take up what is mine and declare it to you. Last verse. All things that the Father has are mine, Jesus says. But look at what he says. Therefore, oh no, all things that the Father has. Wait a minute, I missed the verse. I did miss the verse. Verse 14, let me do that again. He will, no, I didn't miss it, but anyway. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Here we go. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Y'all see that? All things Jesus said are mine. But 
Now when the Holy Spirit, the power of God comes to be in you, everything that I have, I'm declaring it to you. Y'all get that? Everything Jesus has, everything Jesus does, the power that he operated in, the authority that the Father gave him when he was here on earth, he says, now I'm giving it to you. Now, interesting thing about this, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us. Well, what is he going to do? Well, verse 8 says, and when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Y'all ready for this? Guess how he's going to do that? Through you. Y'all get that? The Holy Spirit's job is going to convict the world of sin. But the Holy Spirit doesn't have a body. We do. And the body that he chose to be saved, that is us, God will use to convict the world of sin, one, of judgment, two, and of righteousness, three. It's going to happen through you. And the only way that happens is if we allow the Holy Spirit to do it. Because he's not a bully. God is not going to make us. He's not going to force us. But he will prompt us. He will open doors and you will see certain things and you'll be like, is this what I should do? Like Bible study? That I looked at and said, is this a door that God wants me to do now? Sure, let's go for it. And God says, I love the fact that you were willing to step out by faith, but hold on. But he needs us to be able to allow him to use us. Now, he didn't say convict the, the person. He didn't say point out the person, you're a sinner. He says, no, just let your light shine. Let your works be known unto men. You know, when you go into a dark place, you're the light of the world now. Jesus said, John said first, Jesus is the light of the world. But then Jesus turned around and said, now you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So everything that Jesus was when he was on earth, he's now said, now you are. So now you convict. Now you judge. Now you walk in righteousness and allow the Holy Spirit to use you. Last thing, and this is it, amen? We need to recognize we're chosen for a particular work. It is not by accident that we, if you have been so, uh, born again, are in the kingdom and the family of God. It's not an accident. And let's look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, and then we're going back to John. But Philippians chapter 2, because we're talking about salvation being never ending. Chapter 2, and pick up in verse 12 and 13, it says this. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as much in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Look at what he says. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. He says, listen. This is the Apostle Paul talking to the church of uh, uh, Philippi. And he's telling them, he says, listen, your purpose is to work out your own salvation. Every one of us now that has been born into the kingdom of God has a purpose to actually do something. Amen? I, I like to put it like this. The gift that God gave us was free. So God gave us a gift to be born again. But once you're in the kingdom and once you become born again, now the work of salvation, not, not to be saved, that after being saved that will produce good works is now our job. Now God has chose each one of us who are born again to now do something. And he says, work out your own salvation. He says, look, he says, verse uh, 13, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. 
It's God that is in us that wants to be let out to do whatever God wants to do. We always have this little thing we say at the beginning of the service when uh, uh, we do our call to worship. And the last thing we say is, finally, we're going to let go and let God have his way. Amen? And that's really what he's saying here. It's just let go and let God have his way. Amen? So I want to leave you with this. Salvation is never ending. For those who believe in Christ. God chose us. And that's where we are. You don't have to go there. But in John chapter 15 it says. I did not choose you. Jesus. I mean uh, you did not choose me. Jesus says. I chose you. And Jesus says. And I chose you to bear fruit. And that your fruit should remain. We're all supposed to produce. Once you're born in the kingdom. We got work to do. And so God chose us to bear fruit. And this is where we want to leave right now, is that the fruit that we're bearing, or will bear, will remain. Because it's not you, it's the God in you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us say, if you hear God, if you